Hello, everybody. Um, today we're going to be talking about the phylum Nematoda, which includes roundworms. Um, they're also known as ectosozas, um, which basically means um, that they have a cuticle that surrounds them. And a cuticle is usually a non-living layer um, secreted by the epidermis, which is the skin. Um, it generally restricts growth and needs to be molted or shedded um, before they can grow in size. Think of an arthropod, um, which has to shed its exoskeleton to grow. Um, they are actually closely related to arthropods. Um, it's usually regulated by a hormone, um, and nematodes are known as small ectosomes. Um, and we can see here, right, here's the nematodes. Um, other animals you might know that also fall under this group, right, all arthropods, um, and also tardigrades. Um, the diversity, there are close to 25,000 different species of roundworms. Um, they live in every biome all over the world. Um, if you look at the topsoil, which is the top few feet of soil around the world, generally in about one acre of topsoil, you can find about a billion different um, nematodes. Um, some traits, nematodes are triploblastic. Um, they are pseudocolomates um, with complete guts. Um, that differs from the platyhelminthes, which were acolomates with incomplete guts. Um, we can see here what the pseudocolomate looks like. They have the secondary cavity surrounding the gut, but it's not completely lined by mesoderm or muscle. Um, instead, they have muscle that surrounds the outside um, layer, but not the inside layer. Um, roundworms are cylindrically shaped. They don't have cilia or flagella to help in body movement. Instead, they have longitudinal muscles in their body wall that help them move and wiggle around. Um, reproduction, most are dioecious, which means they have separate sexes, where the males are generally smaller than the females. Um, fertilization is internal and eggs are stored in a uterus until deposited. Um, so, the rest of our notes is gonna be talking about a few example species. Um, so the first one is Ascaris. Um, this is generally the most common type of roundworm and they're the largest in size. Um, it actually occurs in up to 25,000 or 25% of people in some areas of the Southeastern United States. Um, and more than 1.27 billion people are affected worldwide by this parasite. Um, generally, they're found in the intestines of horse and pigs, um, and they get passed on to humans that way, um, generally eating undercooked pork. Um, and a female scars, when she reaches maturity, can lay up to 200,000 eggs a day, which pass out the host's feces, um, find its way into soil, and continue the life cycle like that. Um, this is the um, what they look like. I think they look like bean sprouts. Um, generally on uh, the male, which is the one on top, is smaller than the female, which is on bottom. Um, they can survive in long periods of time in the soil. And if a, ho a host swallows um, an egg, the juveniles then hatch and burrow through the intestinal wall where they live there and feed on um, the contents of the intestine. Um, if it goes for a long time without being treated, they can block or even perforate the intestines, which means like, make a hole in them. Um, infection rates tend to be a little bit higher in children and in males, and that's gonna be similar for all of the parasites we're gonna talk about today. Um, the main reason for that is because children and males usually don't wash their hands as well and have poorer hygiene um, than women and adults. Um, here's the general life cycle, right? The egg can survive in soil for a long time. Um, once ingested, um, it makes its way into the intestine where it develops into an adult. The adult releases eggs, the eggs make their way through the feces, and if the feces find their way into the soil, the cycle starts all over again. So that's Ascaris. Um, next up is hookworms. Um, hookworms, um, they are smaller than Ascaris. Um, they have a hook-like curve at their mouth that looks like a teeth or like a big tooth. Um, there are separate sexes. Um, they generally suck the host's blood um, and heavy infections can cause anemia. 
The eggs pass out in feces and then juveniles hatch in the soil. Um, and if humans come in contact um, with the soil um, and don't wash their hands or if it gets um, into the blood um, through the soil and through the skin, um, then it travels in the blood to the lungs where it can be coughed up, swallowed, and then mature in the intestine. Um, here's what a hookworm looks like. You can see the little plates in the mouth, which they use to cut into the intestine and suck blood. Um, life cycle for this, again, they make their way into the lungs, get coughed up, um, swallowed, and brought into the intestine. Um, where they get all of the blood they need to turn into adults. Egg release as feces, um, which then can make their way into soil, um, grows into a juvenile, and then reinfects the host. Next up is what's called a trichina worm, um, which can cause a potentially lethal trichinosis. Um, what happens in this case is the adult worms burrow into the intestinal wall and the female directly produces juvenile worms. Um, the juvenile worms penetrate through blood vessels um, and generally into tissues and spaces that surround it like the skeletal muscle. Um, and so they burrow into skeletal muscle all over the body of somebody who's infected. Um, and then when that skeletal muscle gets ingested um, by something, Let's say that the skeletal muscle belonged to an animal like a bear, which they're commonly found in black bears. Um, so if it's found in the skeletal muscle of the bear and it's not properly cooked, um, what happens is then the juvenile worms hatch inside of the host. Um, and they have this very, very cool survival mechanism where those cysts that the juveniles are in are only broken up um, by stomach acid. Uh, which is a awesome survival mechanism, right? They're protected in this little cyst um, until they're ingested by something broken apart in the stomach acid, and then they turn into adults, which do the same thing where they burrow back in um, to blood or burrow into blood vessels, um, mate, and then um, release the cyst into the muscles. Um, generally, if there's a heavy infection, um, it can cause death. Um, and here's what it looks like. Here are these little cysts in the muscles. Um, and so these are just basically sitting there in the muscles um, in like a long-term storage waiting to be eaten and ingested. And once eaten and ingested, um, they turn into the adult worm um, that can move on with its life. Next up is pinworms. Um, pinworms are the most common parasite in the United States, um, but they don't cause very much disease. Generally, they live in the large intestine, um, and at night, the female will migrate to the anal region, lay eggs, and it'll cause itching. Um, and so that's the number one sign of having this pinworm, is having anal itching, um, specifically at night. Um, then what happens is somebody who's infected with this will kind of scratch the anal region, contaminate their hand and bed cloths. Um, and then you, know, you think of a kid who scratches in the middle of the night, um, they might um, scratch, go back to sleep, not think about it in the morning, not wash their hands, go eat breakfast. Uh, and then those get pat, uh, passed on to the intestine and the life cycle continues over and over and over again. Um, Um, here's what a female pinworm looks like, and then here's a group of pinworm eggs. Next up for our worms are known as the folio worms. Um, folio worms generally are known to block the lymphatic system, um, which can then cause inflammation and blockage of the lymphatic ve uh, vessels. Um, females release live young um, into either the blood or the lymph, um, and generally these are passed on by mosquitoes. Um, so when mosquitoes ingest the tiny microfilia, um, which are basically the little young, um, they pass it to the new host through the blood. Um, and then they swim into the lymph system, clog that, um, reproduce. Um, and one type of disease caused by a filial worm is called elephantiasis, which happens from a repeated exposure from a filial worm. Um, which causes swelling and growth of 
connective tissue and lymphatic systems um, because of the flea worm. Um, here's what elephantiasis looks like down here, where um, they've had repeated exposure to this roundworm, um, which clogs the lymph system, causes these um, limbs to grow large in size, and it stays like that forever. Um, if you haven't already watched the video on elephantiasis, I suggest you watch it uh, because it is pretty interesting. Um, again, these are passed on by mosquitoes um, as the main vector here. Um, there are other types um, of flail worms here. Um, the other most common type um, that you should know is called the African guinea worm. Um, the African guinea worm is passed on through contaminated water. The African guinea worm um, is extremely painful. Um, what happens is the adult worm makes its way through the body um, into um, the skeletal muscle, um, specifically down to generally the foot, um, as we can see down here. Um, and it is a very, very painful process to try to get that guinea worm out of the foot because you can't just pull it, one, because it's extremely painful, um, and two, if you the worm breaks, um, it then the head is still left in there and it can still grow. And so people who have guinea worm generally have to wrap something like a stick or a pencil around it and every day slowly and painfully twist it a little more and a little more um, until it eventually comes out. Um, this can be a very debilitating parasite um, that can wreak havoc on communities. Um, one of the biggest um, ways that people are trying to prevent this is to introduce water filtration in places where there is not great um, water quality, where these guinea worm larvae um, live in the water pretty consistently. Um, the last one we'll talk about, another type of filial worm, um, is known as African river blindness. Um, it's passed on through biting black flies, um, which pass on the larvae of this filial worm. Um, and this one works similarly as the last one, but instead of making its way through the foot, it makes its way into the eye where it can leave um, eye lesions um, and potentially lead to blindness. Um, so general um, treatment for all parasitic worms. Um, one of the first courses of treatments is antibiotics um, because if you can kill the bacteria that live inside the worms, generally you can kill the worms because they have a symbiotic relationship where they live off of each other. Um, there are also some anti-parasitic medicines. Um, the pinworms that we talked about that live in the anal region at night and release aches, um, oftentimes those can be removed with just an anti-parasitic medicine, similar to like you would give a dog. Um, in extreme cases, you might need to do extraction or removal. Um, Ascaris is generally the one that you'll see that happen to the most because they grow largest in size um, and most numerous. And so if somebody has a really bad Ascaris um, infection, they might need to have it, um, their intestine opened up um, and remove the Ascaris worms. And there are some general diet habits like garlic, pumpkin seeds, pomegranate juice, or coconut milk, which are known to um, keep the worms at bay, right? They're, the worms are less likely um, to like those situations where those foods are introduced. Um, and detection of parasites, some symptoms include diarrhea, fever, rashes, constipation, pain in the intestinal area, or muscle pain, um, like constant muscle pain for the trichinosis. Generally, stool samples are needed to detect eggs or cysts. Um, if we go back to the flatworms, um, tapeworms, generally people are deficient in vitamin B12 um, if they have a tapeworm. Um, and then um, worst case, a blood sample will be taken to detect liver functions. Um, that's all I got for you. Thank you for watching.